The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Drew Endy wants to build. So he needs tools, like nuts and bolts, standard parts that work together. You don't need a PhD to know this, but a PhD may help, say, if you were building not with bricks or steel, but with DNA. It may sound like science fiction, but a new generation of scientists known as synthetic biologists is using genetic nuts and bolts to build new functions into living things. The possibilities abound. Imagine living cells acting as memory devices, or microbes that brew biofuels, or drugs that can save lives. If you were to decide that you wanted to use biology as a technology for manufacturing something, it might be a chemical or a drug or a food or a material, you'd have to figure out how to reprogram a living organism. Synthetic biology is the process to design and build that living organism. We've known about DNA, the molecular blueprint of life, since 1953. But in order to build from this blueprint and modify it, you need to do more than just read it. You need to be able to make genes, the building blocks of an organism, and assemble them to change the genetic structure and functions of the organism. In the past, engineering with DNA was a bit like trying to write a book, but doing so only using words and sentences found in other books. So you rip out pages, you cut and paste the words together. Cumbersome if you're on deadline. Now let's say you have a new powerful tool, a word processor that lets you easily and efficiently put those words together. This tool for writing or constructing genes quickly is helping make synthetic biology possible. When I was getting my degree, we had to cut and paste very laboriously genes out of organisms. Now we can completely throw all of that knowledge out, in a sense, and we can order specific sequences that we want, where instead of having to bring together words that already exist in biology, we can write out exactly what we want. And so we can create sequences that would have taken us years to try to build by the more traditional methods and get them in days. So exactly how do you make genes from scratch? Well, let's say you want to make a gene found in ocean bacteria that turn cells blue. First, you need to know the gene's recipe, which is comprised of molecules called nucleotides that are commonly known by their first letter, A's, T's, C's, and G's. Then you can tailor that gene, modifying it to fit your needs. So you use a program to specify things about it, like how blue it makes the cells. Then, just submit your order via email, and firms like DNA 2.0 and Menlo Park will actually build it for you. This machine, the DNA synthesizer, does the first step, the assembly of single strands of the gene from sugars and phosphates. Based on the length of the gene, it can take from four to 10 days. The cost, roughly $1,500 for this particular gene. When it's done, our gene is mailed off, then, just mix the gene with water and bacteria cells, and voila, cells that turn blue. Custom genes made to order. And though they're built into living cells, the process is one of renovation, not creation. We are not creating life. Uh, we are modifying uh, biological systems. And we're doing so in a more predictable way than we were ever able to do using standard genetic engineering techniques. We're essentially making the engineering of biology more predictable and therefore safer. So what's to stop someone from going online and ordering genes for a lethal virus? We've actually gotten gene synthesis companies on board to screen all of their gene synthesis orders so that they're not sending out genes that would encode some toxic protein. And with the cost of gene synthesis falling by roughly half every two years, orders flood in. But making genes is the easy part. If you knew what to say, you could use synthetic biology to write new genetic narratives. The challenge is to figure out what the heck do you want to say. 
And to figure out what you want to say with synthetic biology, you need to have more than just the ability to write those genetic narratives. You need a vocabulary of simple words that can be snapped together to make useful statements. It's akin to building an electrical device with off-the-shelf parts designed to work together. In electronics, you see very refined, heavily standardized objects that are available via mass production off the shelf that work together. So what synthetic biology is trying to figure out how to do is how would you standardize all these different pieces of DNA so that when you put them together, it's not a surprise what happens, it's what we expect. In 2003, Drew Endy co-founded the world's first registry of standard biological parts contributed by scientists and students. To promote and protect this resource, he and others at MIT, Harvard, and the University of California, San Francisco set up a nonprofit. The Biobricks Foundation, or BBF for short, came to life in order to enable an open technology platform. We're starting at the DNA level, we're making a toolkit of parts, these basic biological functions, that are coming from all over the living world, but now being integrated into a common platform that everybody can use. You can have pieces of DNA that are designed to go together as reliably as nuts and bolts. Jeff Tabor is helping to stock the BioBrick store with one of those genetic nuts and bolts. So one of the things we've done in the lab is uh, engineer E. coli to be able to act as a film that can take a photograph. Um, to do this, uh, we introduced a light receptor gene from algae into E. coli. So what we do is take a little bit of the engineered E. coli, and we add them to a media, and we pour them on a flat surface so that they form a two-dimensional film. And once this is done, all we need to do is let them grow overnight. So we've been able to use this technology to produce photographs or portraits of uh, many different things. For example, Albert Einstein, Alfred Hitchcock, uh, the Virgin Mary. But we can also use it to produce logos. Here's how it works. A projector shines red light through a black and white slide containing an image. When the algae light receptor in the plate of bacteria detects the red light shown on it, it shuts off production of a black pigment which the bacteria make when they're in the dark. And so the result is a plate of bacteria which have light and dark areas that correspond to the pattern on the projected image. But don't expect to capture your Kodak moments with E. coli anytime soon. The problem with E. coli films is that they take hours to produce images as opposed to seconds for a traditional camera. But the cool thing is that uh, E. coli are so small that we can fit about 10 billion E. coli pixels on this petri dish as opposed to about 1 million or so pixels on your computer monitor. Even if there's no direct application yet, it's no small feat to take a light-sensitive gene from algae and turn it on in blind bacteria. It's the power of synthetic biology, where genes are assembled into existing cells to create circuits that program the cells to do new things, like make an image. And synthetic biology is now making its mark outside the lab. As Jay Kiesling and Jack Newman know, it's a technology that can help save lives. Artemisinin is the drug of choice for treating malaria. It comes from the wormwood plant. It takes a long time to produce it, about 14 months. And there are large spikes in the prices, which means that it's very difficult to predict the price, and that price is then passed on to the consumer. In this case, consumers are people who earn less than a dollar per day. In any given year, between one and three million people who can't afford treatment die from malaria. 90% are children under five. We hypothesized that we could engineer a microbe to produce artemisinin using synthetic biology. We had to discover the genes that were responsible for producing artemisinin in the plant and then transfer those genes into a microbe. But this cutting edge research needed funding. We put together a grant with the Institute for One World Health, which is a nonprofit pharmaceutical company, uh, Amaris, which was just getting its start in life, and UC Berkeley, and submitted that grant to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, was funded for about $43 million. Using E. coli or yeast, we can now produce artemisinic acid in a fraction of the time that it takes the plant to produce it. 
At Amaris, a biotech firm based in Emeryville, they refine the process by improving the yield of artemisinic acid from the sugar-fed yeast. What you want to see out of a run like this is that you've got good quality material that is either as good as or better than the artemisina that's on the market today. In 2008, pharmaceutical giant Sanofi Aventis was chosen to commercialize the biosynthetic production of artemisinin. If all goes well, it will be made in a matter of weeks rather than months, and by 2012, this low-cost drug could reach malaria sufferers. The same process can be used to direct yeast to brew thousands of other chemicals, even fuel. You can make a biofuel of the future by also putting in a different yeast. So you, you get out a, a beautiful looking diesel like this with just a different brewer's yeast. It's easy to marvel at synthetic biology's potential applications. The hard part is to acknowledge how much we still don't know. The truth is we understand relatively little about the living world. Most of biology is still out there to be discovered. Every time we go out and we sequence more DNA in an environmental sample, we'll tend to find more genes, oftentimes genes that we don't know anything about. In this context, openness and sharing is a no-brainer because that's how you're going to get the most exciting, best ideas, and most useful components coming forward for everybody else to try out and use.